Um, so my name is Cecile. I'm glad to be here today. And uh, I'm here with Training Orchestra, which is right behind us. Um, and basically, we have a system to manage instructor-led training and specifically manage processes to optimize uh, your back office uh, training activity. Um, so in this session, we're going to talk a bit about theory about innovation. We're going to have two case studies as well and talk about ways in which you can use optimization to free resources, time, et cetera, uh, to fuel your innovation efforts. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of research and see what it can tell us about innovation. And I wanted to start with two examples, which maybe some of you know. And it's basically two textbook examples of what can go wrong with innovation. Uh, the first one is Kodak. And Kodak was a very successful uh, film company for cameras, and it failed to take the digital turn. So in this case, we're in a case of too little too late for innovation. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have the Google Glass, which despite coming from a very successful, very innovative company, was a sales flop. Uh, they released it in 2014. Uh, stopped it in 2015, uh, they're starting it up now, but in this case it was maybe too early or maybe not pertinent enough. So the lesson here is, in your learning innovation, you obviously don't want to be Kodak, but you also don't want to be Google. So what are the pitfalls you should avoid? Um, and there are four common pitfalls that we can think of. The first one is not enough resources. Innovation is hard work, and oftentimes, we tend to underestimate the efforts that we need to put in, which leads to creating beautiful ideas on paper that you cannot realize. The second one is misaligned incentives. Because again, innovation is hard work and it's risky. And we should accept failure when it happens and encourage risk taking. But tight budgets or uh, sometimes time constraint or profitability constraints prevents us from encouraging this risk. Thirdly, insufficient insights. And that happens when you know you want to put innovation in your learning activity, for example, but you don't know a lot about your own activity, about your strengths and weaknesses, about where you want to go, and as well externally about what solutions exist. And so you can have maybe the wrong focus and invest in something that's not right for you. And the last one, which I think is really important, is imbalanced focus. And this one is important because there are many different ways to innovate. There are many different areas in which you can innovate, but we tend to have what we could call bias for the shiny object, for the new kid on the block, for the next for a notification, et cetera. And this can cause us to not see maybe different paths that maybe sound less sexy, but that would have more impact for our organization. And this leads us to our next slide, which talks about the innovation portfolio and different ways in which you can innovate. And in particular, um, Harvard Business Review developed this uh, research and said that organizations that invest 70% into the core activity, business as usual, 20% in adjacent activities, and 10% in transformational activity, this sexy new thing, um, outperform their peers with a price to equity premium of 10 to 20%. So this is significant. And this is a model that Larry Page at Google has advocated, and they use it at Google. Um, however, an issue becomes you have to be able to execute at all these levels, and this is difficult to do well. And another theory which can help us, again by Harvard Business Review, is that of ambidextrous organization. And what does this tell us? This tells us that we need to be able to manage business as usual and innovation under the same command, but with different teams that have different mindsets, but that can share resources. And this model has been shown, again, to outperform their peers. So this already gives you tools to think about how you can structure innovation in your own organization. Um, right, so let's see the implications for learning technologies, because that's what we're here for today. Um, and here we can see this concept of learning portfolio come to life, because we see established mainstream technologies, no surprises here. We have the LMS, we have authoring systems, portals, etc. However, things we keep hearing about, and I'm sure you guys have heard about it when you walk you know, in different sessions, talking to vendors, mobile, virtual, social. The reality is that for many organizations, 
it's not something they're using. It's one third to two thirds of an organization using it today. And when we go on to MOOCs, for example, Massive Online Open Courses, it's uh, less than one third. So I'm not saying here at all, only stick to the mainstream. What I'm saying is, it's a portfolio, and maybe you're going to need to invest in MOOCs, but also need to have an LMS, and have the new augment the old. This might be something that you want to look at, and not be distracted by only the newest thing everyone's talking about. Really focus on impact for your organization. And with this, Fossway had developed uh, a good model to think about the process and the different steps to innovation. And this is a balanced model because it encourages you to think not only about the two first steps, not only about once to watch and transforming tomorrow, but also which one am I going to pilot? Which one am I going to adopt? And which one can really scale into my business and provide impact? And it's important, even when you're a step one, to think forward as to how this might fit into business as usual. And this is important because business as usual is called this for a reason. Because there are key drivers that maybe made your business decide that this was going to be your core activity. And if we think about the 70-20-10 model, 70% of your time and effort, it's not going to switch overnight to something else. It's going to adapt and evolve, but it's going to stay your core business for the foreseeable future. And so your job is to optimize this innovation model and to um, have a balance between all those different steps and create space for innovation. So with that, I want to give uh, the floor to you and think about what is stopping your organization today from uh, innovating. So we can do a quick show of hands maybe. For whom is time to work on innovation an issue? Yeah, okay, so quite a few people. Uh, what about budget, simply? Okay. What about accountability? Innovation is a long-term thing and you don't know when it's going to succeed or fail. A little bit, okay. And skills? Okay. And so who here has a good innovation program? You think maybe it's not perfect, but it's working quite well? Not that much? <laughs> okay, I'm glad we're here then. Um, okay, so to that end, we're gonna think together about how to create space to innovate. And the idea, there are four main ways, the way I see it, to create space for innovate. The two first ones are really about resources and time. And the idea is there are many things you could be doing, uh, but you don't have the time or the resources. Optimization can help you enhance productivity and redirect teams to more value-added projects, whether it's a specific innovation task force within your company, or whether it's on a specific project that you want to pilot. Secondly, free up resources, either by reducing costs or by opening back up new revenue streams. So let's say you sell external training on top of having your own internal training. By making this external training more profitable, you could also direct this revenue into uh, innovation initiatives. And the two other ones are not about resources. And more creatively, it's about how to lower risk in your overall innovation effort by building maybe a riskier solution, a more novel solution, onto a strong core that is going to be stable and reliable. And how to improve focused by optimizing your business and understanding what are your key strengths and weaknesses and focus your innovation on the highest impact initiatives that take into account these trends and these weaknesses. Uh, and with this, I want to show a little bit how we've thought about this at Training Orchestra. And what we've thought about is really capitalize on five key trends that we see can have a lot of impact for organizations today. And so we saw that instructor-led training represents that's 65% in the US, it's even higher in Europe, of formal training. It's effective, people like it, but it's too costly. And so the challenge is, is an easy one in the end. It's to make it as effective, but more efficient. Second and third one are about addressing audiences that traditionally have not been addressed in the traditional LMS portal. Technical or field workers that don't have access to a portal, uh, external audiences, etc. Fourth one is about integrating instructor-led training into new methods such as informal, et cetera. And the fifth one, which I think is probably the most important one, is training ROI and knowing the results you have from training, but also knowing what you're investing. And the reality is that a lot of companies today don't know how much they're investing, and they don't have enough accurate information to basically know how to optimize their training activity. So even if you know that it's effective, you don't know how to rationalize and make the most of your training dollars. 
So what we try to do is to help companies really optimize their training activity and focus on things that can be impactful to them because of scale. For example, if they have 80% of instructor led training or because strategically it's important for them to train external audiences. Um, and what I want to say here is that this approach of really innovating in something that might not seem sexy, but that has a lot of business impact for companies, is something that works. So here it's the Fosway 9 grid learning system, and they're really looking at different learning technologies. And we're here on the bottom right, uh, identified as a strong performer. And it's sort of a unique positioning, because generally people talk more about uh, innovation in terms of yeah, these, these new things. And they don't really talk about optimization uh, in the same way. Um, and to be a bit more concrete, we've developed a study that can help you assess your own uh, weaknesses and strengths in managing training and how much you can save by optimizing uh, your activity and specific areas where you could get better. So you can try it if you want. It's calculator.training-orchestra.com. And with a few short questions, you can already have an idea of where you could get impact, where you could redirect resources for your innovation efforts, for example. Um, and now let's move on to two case studies uh, from our clients. So the first one is a training company. It's an internal training academy by PwC. And they created this training academy because they wanted to um, uh, offer continuous training and of course, because they're operating training as a business, the concept of optimization for them is important because they know that it drives profitability. So it already makes them a good candidate to understand this concept of optimization. However, where it's interesting is that they had a vision that they wanted to offer personalized learning journeys and not just group, one-shot group sessions. So they had this concept of learning journey and they're training 10,000 learners a year. 80% of this is customized. And in order to do this, they really needed to optimize the entire training operation. So they had a dual objective of performance on one hand, so financial performance, and personalization. So I think this really speaks to the concept of ambidex ambidextrous organization, as we were thinking be be uh, before. How do we actually do this? So they implemented training orchestra. They already had cornerstone. And uh, the results that they saw were, first of all, better user experience and better uh, customer uh, satisfaction because they were providing more value to the customer. Uh, and then in terms of performance, they saw a budget saving, savings of 12%, uh, led not exclusively, but for example, by increasing occupancy rates of their session 20 to 30%. So this is the way uh, PwC managed to optimize and innovate at the same time. And a second case is different. It's a multinational L&D department, uh, insurance industry. And their problem was um, that they had a complex multinational activity. And they wanted to offer the best learning experience, including both online and offline, for all their workforce. So this is what they had envisioned. They already had an LMS. And they wanted to optimize their back office, for example having visibility over their instructor-led courses, managing the logistics, managing their resources, and having visibility over their budgets, over their costs, and being able to forecast their budget and knowing exactly what they're spending. And on the other hand, they wanted to implement a learning experience platform to really integrate the whole um, learning experience uh, on the front end. And so the systems they choose were success factors as an LMS, training orchestra for the back end, and they recently implemented Degreed. And I think with this example, it really makes us think of the innovation portfolio. Because again, they're using different types of systems to achieve a goal overall of better learning experience, so more effective, and more business impact, more efficient on the back end. So here are some key takeaways uh, for today. First of all, optimizing can help you free uh, resources, so budget, et cetera, uh, human capital. It can help you free time, lower risk, and also focus your innovation efforts into the highest impact initiatives. Because optimization at its core about getting the most impact. Innovate where you need it, where your customers need it. Beware of the shiny objects. Look at them, implement them, but in a holistic learning strategy where you have also optimization within. Balance your innovation approach. 
multiple technologies can cohabitate. You can have a learning stack, such as uh, the case we were looking at before. Um, and technologies can augment each other's. And fourth, uh, innovation doesn't just happen. It's made, it's something that you have to make happen. Um, and yeah, I mean, up to you um, to do it. So, do we have any questions uh, about the presentation? Have you ever used this for um, areas such as manufacturing and engineering? So yes. Orchestra and stuff like that. Exactly. So, for example, we work with a lot of companies uh, exactly in the uh, industrial sector, and basically they would use it to uh, manage their logistics for training, especially when you have uh, equipments, like complicated equipment that you need to have for every session, and when you have instructors that have specific skills that are needed, and on a large scale, you need to plan which instructor is going to be used when, optimize the use of the skill, and optimize the use of your equipment. For example, if you need to train your customers on using specific cranes, etc., you might do simulations, you might use the real equipment, and we would help you uh, optimize the use of these resources. So absolutely industry, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Great talk. So I saw that in the last case study you had the grid and then there was an LMS and then there was another tool. Mm -hmm. um, what have you found to be best practices for making sure that different platforms like that work together? I mean, we all know that we need to invest time and study each functionality across different tools, but mm -hmm. it's still very hard to make sure that buying three things will result in a coherent um, yeah. you know, ecosystem. I would say uh, there are two elements to this. The first one is buying technologies that are complementary and that don't have too much overlap. So in this case, um, Degreed really has a mission to be a customer-facing, well, a learner-facing system and to integrate the entire learning experience. The LMS manages the online uh, content delivery, et cetera, and, and tracking progress, and we manage the back end. So that's, a, you know, functionally, they have different missions. And the second one, more technically, I would say it's choosing solutions that are scalable, uh, that are built on a simple architecture that is not too customized. Because the more you customize an initial solution, the more difficult it's going to be to make it work with another solution. So generally, when you have uh, an initial system, so for example, at Training Orchestra, we know that the tech stack is important. So uh, we make sure that our architecture can plug in easily with a lot of different LMSs that it's a core system that can be configured but not customized to the extent that then you can plug it in. So I would say those are two uh, important aspects. Any other question? No? Okay, well thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>